Welcome to First Sim Fiction, your first stop for learning to write fantastic fiction. I am your host, Aaron Gansky, author of The Bargain, The Hand of Adonai series, and Firsts in Fiction. And I'm Alton Gansky, Aaron's father, and so I suppose all the blame comes to me. Um, and I'm still in Central California, still writing books, working on a, a short nonfiction piece uh, that's been eating up all my time. I've been having a lot of fun with, but... Uh, uh, so it's good to be here. Good to see you, Aaron. And we have someone special with us today. Edie Melson is joining us. Edie Melson is uh, the co-director of the Blue Ridge Mountain Christian Writers uh, Conference, and she is an author in her own right. She's uh, done some fiction, some steampunk, likes the steampunk stuff, but her most recent books have been nonfiction, uh, including uh, this little puppy right here. See if I can get to the camera. It says, While My Soldier Serves, it's a series of prayers for uh, people who have uh, folks in the military, and it's uh, really a whole series of books that are coming out by uh, uh, Worthy, isn't it? Isn't that right, Edie? Yep, Worthy Inspired. Okay, so Worthy Publishing. And uh, she's joining us to talk about how to uh, make time to write. Excellent. Absolutely. Super glad to have you here, Edie. Um, what are you currently working on? Um, right now, in addition to regular blogging that I do, I am uh, gearing up on the next book in the series, which will be While My Child is Away, prayers for uh, people who have a child who's away at college or camp or uh, just away from home for the first time. Excellent. Excellent. So, uh, super glad to, ha to have you along. Uh, I've enjoyed being able to be on staff with you at Blue Ridge. You've got, you're full of great ideas, a lot of uh, really good social media knowledge, uh, and everything I hear about you is positive, so uh, I take that as a good sign. Uh, hey, you're <clears throat> probably not talking to the right people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm talking to my father, so I think your point is valid. Um, I mean, you, you make that point there. So. <laughs> Well, today uh, we're going to talk about making time to write, but before we do so, a couple things, uh, orders of business, if you will. Uh, if you have not yet voted for your favorite first line from June, uh, please do so. You can find that uh, on AaronGansky.com on, on my blog there, and I'll, I'll give you guys uh, another day or two to finish up your votes to see who wins that $15 gift card. And we're already uh, starting off for July, so our July winner, our first July winner, is a familiar name to you if you've been following along. It's Lori Roloveld, who, um, I don't know, maybe we should uh, talk to her about retirement here from the con competition. <laughs> this is the second one in, I think, six weeks. So, uh, But her line says, uh, The sky promised rain all day but withheld it, and doesn't that just figure like God colluded with all he created to carry out his petty-fogging plan to deny Wiley Patchett everything he wanted in life, even the common blessing of a solid rain that might have slowed the wildfires before they consumed the derelict cabin he called home. Oh, wow. And that's one sentence. <laughs> she, she's got a semicolon in there, uh, but otherwise it's all one sentence. It's grammatically, uh, it's sound. It's, it's well done. So I... I don't know if this is just my own personal bent, but I kind of like some of these longer sentences that give us a lot of good information and really help develop the the narrator's voice. Because I think that, uh, like Molly Joe last week, uh, her her winning line just really sold the narrator's voice, uh, and I I like that. I like knowing what I'm in for uh, and hearing that that voice early on from the first line. So uh, congratulations, Lori. So you're currently in the competition to for the $15 gift card for June, and you'll be in the competition for July's gift card uh, in a few weeks. So congratulations to you. Um, and uh, Pops, you've got a publishing term of the week here for us. Sure. But before we do, I want to tell you why I like this. Uh, normally with first lines, we go to uh, shorter lines. Call me Ishmael, for example. Um, but she carries this off very well. I think it's a great first line because you can't let go as a reader. You're already involved. You already have a character mentioned. You already have the weather set. You already have setting, um, derelict cabin, and it's all uh, really just in one line. So I think it's a, a fabulous piece. Plus, anybody who uses pedophaging <laughs> deserves some kind of, of, of praise because I don't think I've seen that word since 1852. Um, it's, uh, it's great. 
Yes, publishing term of the week is a very simple one. It's called author discount. Uh, <clears throat> authors get discounts on their own books. You would think since you wrote it, all your books you would get would be free, but no, it doesn't quite work that way because they have to pay for all the paper, the ink, and everything else that goes with it. But normally uh, when you sign a contract, your contract will tell you, um, first of all, how many free books as an author you get and then what you can buy other books at at a reduced price. And it's usually at least in my experience, it's usually about the same discount that bookstores get, which is roughly 50 to 55 percent off. Um, again, you have to look at a contract. That's one of the things you look at when you're getting ready to sign a contract. But you would be buying it at the same price a bookstore buys in. Bookstore usually buys at 50 percent of the cover price, so they get half the money, and then the publisher gets half the money. Uh, out of that, and then uh, the writer gets some small percentage after that uh, off the uh, the publisher side of things. So, author discount that's what you get to buy your books for because you will have to buy your own books uh, unless you negotiate a great big uh, upfront free set of books. And um, so Excellent. that's it yes. for this week. Author discount. Excellent. So. Uh, <laughs> Yes, Edie. Uh, what did you? I, I should have asked you both before about the first line before I went to the author discount, the publishing term of the day. Did you? Did you like our first line for this week? I do. I do. I'm normally not a huge fan of of long, long sentences, but this one is just crafted so well. She doesn't lose me at all, and I can follow it perfectly. So I really like it. I'm a big fan of this one. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, keep keep the uh, keep the submissions coming. Uh, really love. I'm enjoying this. I'm I'm loving reading these first lines. I you know I get a taste of different styles of writing. So uh, a lot of fun. And pretty soon you guys will be earning your own author discounts if you're not already. You see how smoothly I did that. That's <laughs> trying to tie the two together. It doesn't work. That was not smooth. Too. Okay. I like right. it. All right, sweet. Now, I pride myself on my terrible transitions, but. Uh, Speaking of terrible transitions, how about making time to write? Uh, this is perhaps one of the question I'm most often asked by uh, what I would call aspiring writers, new writers. I, I like to think of them as new writers rather than aspiring writers, um, simply because if you call yourself an aspiring writer, it seems like you're giving yourself permission not to write. Um, it, you're giving yourself permission to say, well, I'm too busy to write. And you need to kind of get past that. The, the only time you know the old saying is nobody finds time to write you have to make it and so the question that I'm often asked is how do you make time to write because I am uh, a husband I'm a father I've got three young boys I've got an 11 and 9 and a six and a half year old at home um, I work until recently 45 minutes away from home so I had an hour and a half in the car every day uh, five days a week um, and people want to know. I mean, I work full time. How do you how do you find the time to write? How do you make that time to write? And so we thought we'd do a, a, an episode on that. Different writers handle it differently. Uh, we can't give you a comprehensive list of all the ways uh, that there there is to make time to write. But there's big. The big thing is to know that you are making that time to write. And I think the first step for us really is to commit to writing to prioritize it. You've got to be able to say, again, you've got to stop thinking of yourself as an aspiring writer and start saying, I am a writer. And in order to do that, you have to write, which means uh, we only have 24 hours in the day, and I'm pretty sure that you're not just wasting them. Um, maybe you could play a little less Candy Crush, um, mm -hmm. but some of, them you, some of you have two jobs out there, and, and you're ge genuinely working from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. So how do you prioritize? How do you commit to writing? Uh, Pops, what do you do um, in, in context of pri prioritizing your writing, committing to it? Well, technically I write full-time now, so it's uh, not that big a problem. It's usually uh, juggling projects uh, so that I have time to write. Uh, but when I was first starting out, uh, I would uh, walk home uh, from where I was working. It was about a three-mile walk, and I would listen to uh, uh, a novel on uh, audio. I hate to admit it, but I think they were cassettes at the time. <laughs> um, eight track? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, big eight track or, you know, uh, one of those big things you put on your shoulder and play. Uh, 
so yeah, no CDs at the uh, at the moment, no uh, MP3s and that kind of thing. But that would get me uh, my head in the game because I was hearing fiction. And then uh, first thing I would do was sit down and write as much as I could. And then uh, you guys, you and your sisters, would come home and stuff uh, like that. So uh, it's really carving out bits of time. We all get the same amount of time every day. We we still get the 24 hours. The question is, what's taking that time? Some of those things are very worthwhile. They're not everything as a time thief, but we do have to make uh, a priority out of uh, out of it, and you have to carve the time out. So, I like to tell the story of Jerry Jenkins, who's had a little bit of success in writing. Um, he's written I forget how many how many books, but it's a lot, a lot of books. And then he finally hit it big with the Left Behind series. He was at the time uh, an editor uh, for a magazine, and what he would do is he would come home and play with the kids, and uh, he would uh, spend time with his wife. When they went to bed, that's when he would write. He couldn't do it during the day because he was working at the magazine, and then he wanted to give his family all the time. So what he did was he sacrificed sleep. Um, that's not everybody can do that, but he, you know, once the kids were in bed, uh, then he would slip off into his uh, office and begin. Uh, to do his writing. I know writers who would get up early, like at four in the morning, uh, to start, you know, at least get an hour or two in uh, to write. But I think you're right. You have to make some kind of priority out of all of this. How do you handle that, Edie? Well, I'm, um, I'm a lot like, well, when I started, I was where you are now, Aaron. Uh, my kids were very young, and so I had an agreement with my husband and I would do the family thing in the evening and then when everybody went to bed, went to sleep, I would get up and I would write until about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. And then my husband would get up in the mornings and get the boys ready for school and take them to school and I would sleep in a little while and then get up and do the mommy thing and the PTA thing and the day would start over again. I think the biggest thing for me, because I am so ADD, is I have to have a schedule because I'm too easily distracted. So even though it may not be a normal schedule, I still have to have a schedule that I follow. Agreed, and I, I want to make a couple points here. First of all, every writer is going to be different. You're going to hear varying different opinions on on how to do this. Um, I think making a schedule is good, even if you don't write it down. If you just if you're aware of it, um, what that says is that since I'm since I am consciously deciding to write, I'm going to consciously make that time of my day. I think writing it down is a good idea, um, so that if not for yourself, for everybody else around you who um, is very likely, especially if you haven't published anything, they're very likely not to take your writing seriously or at least not to take it as seriously as you take it. And that can be a, a bad situation. That can be kind of a toxic situation. So I think you want to make sure that you're getting some supporters behind you, spe specifically your family. And one thing that the three of us mentioned is that we made time to write but we still prioritized time for our families. Uh, like you were saying, Pops, I don't write um, when when I come home. Uh, I, I'm done writing. I do my writing at school while I'm while I'm there. Uh, during the summer, I will write in the mornings. The first thing in the morning, mainly because my wife is still sleeping and the kids are kind of on autopilot these days. But I'll do my writing before I even make them their breakfast. Uh, so I'm not really sacrificing a ton of time with them because it still gives me the afternoon and the evenings with them, etc. Uh, and I've heard some people say very adamantly that you have to yell at your family and scream at them and yell obscenities so that they understand that you're serious about your writing. I tend to disagree with that. I think that's a very good way to make more time to write by getting rid of your family um, and driving them away in a bad way. It's not the way you want to handle it. So um, don't... I don't, uh, you know, sacrifice your family for your writing, but also don't sacrifice your writing for anything else. I, I mean, you, you've got to still be able to prioritize it. You don't want to give up your writing so that you can play more video games. You want to do it. You want to make sure that you're writing, and you want to make sure that your family understands that. And so you can speak to them with love and respect and say, you know what, uh, my son Levi comes up to me constantly while I'm working, and he says, can we play? Daddy, I said, absolutely, we just can't play right now. 
um, give me a certain amount of time, or I'll tell him check the clock when the clock says this. Then I can then I can play with you, um, or I'll tell him I've got to finish X amount of pages, and then he'll you know of course come up and and want to talk about six or seven more times, and I've got to tell him you know every time you talk to me, it's going to take me a little bit longer to finish my work. So you know I, I do want to play and I do want to hang out, but we're going to have to do that a little bit later. Let me have my time right now. So this, the more you let me work, the quicker I'm done, the more time we're going to have to play. And so I try and spell it out for him in, in ways without having to bite his head off and without having to alienate him you know, for the rest of his life that uh, this is still a priority. My wife has always been very, very good and very supportive uh, of my writing, and, and she will make sure that I'm getting time to write. Uh, she knows I'm a different person when I have time to write than when I don't. Um, she's She'll often say when I get irritated and, and just, you know, angry at the world and I just want to burn everything down. She goes, have you written lately? No, I haven't written anything. Goes, Why don't you go write for an hour and then you can come out of your room. <laughs> Puts me <laughs> on a timeout, you know. <laughs> so she's very, been very supportive of me in that way. And, uh, Pops, I know mom's been supportive of your writing as well. Yeah, and that makes a huge difference. Uh, not everybody gets that uh, kind of blessing where you've got people who are supporting you and uh, helping take care of kids and stuff like that. So you end up ultimately having to to make other kinds of adjustments. But there's always going to be some kind of sacrifice. I don't believe in sacrificing family um, or your job because, you know, who knows when you're going to be able to have enough money to make it as a writer. So you don't want to uh, get to where you're sacrificing some important things. And we we have to remember there are, writing is not everything. There are things more important than writing. I always feel like I should wash my mouth out with soap when I say that, you know, because we're so programmed. Um, but there are more important things than writing. Um, the universe has not changed because I've written a bunch of books. Uh, maybe some people have. I don't know. I know I've changed, but it is not the most important thing. It is the thing I love to do, but it, there may be things that supersede that and uh, sometimes I have to set them aside um, and attend to those. So. Writing is not the most important thing, though sometimes it will feel that way. Uh, and another thing that I've done uh, is I've learned to run away. Uh, mm -hmm. I used to go to Starbucks all the time. And the reason was I'd go in there and say, okay, I can't leave until I finish uh, a certain number of words or a certain number of pages. And while the coffee's good, I don't like the chairs. <laughs> <laughs> so after a while, I get to where I'm really pushing it because I've got to get out of that wood chair sitting at a, at a desk. Uh, but I find that getting out of the house sometimes helps uh, me to uh, uh, get some things done. So I used to I used to do that too. And then I'd also write, uh, especially when I was first starting. Uh, anytime I could uh, I could get a few minutes. If you just jot it down on paper, and then maybe write a little bit more later uh, when you can actually type it up. But those little snatches of time can add up. Absolutely. How about you, Edie? You, um, you balanced your family with your writing. Your kids, are they supportive, or, or did you have to have the talk with them, or how did that go for you? Uh, they were very supportive, but they were also active boys, and they did want attention, and so it helped that I was able to write when they were asleep or in bed. Um, but one of the things that I had trouble with was um, the outlay of cash that came with beginning a writing career whether it was books or uh, memberships or conferences or whatever. And one thing that my husband told me early on was that uh, if I had wanted to change careers and get a different college degree, he'd have been more than happy to support that. But the way to become a writer was to spend time writing and to spend some money to do it. And so he saw that as much, as, as much a priority as if I had gone back to college. And looking at it that way helped me realize that, yes, I could spend the time that I needed. I could invest that time without, um, without being selfish. And I could also invest that money. That's a really good point. One I hadn't considered. Writing um, can be can be a money sink if you're buying computers and software, etc. Um, and I th I think uh, a lot of new writers out there um, have had that conversation with their their families, and perhaps it hasn't gone as smoothly. Um, you say you're a writer, but you're not making money. Uh, how does that equate? Um, you're spending all this time for no real benefit. Well, of course, there's a benefit, but it's not necessarily a tangible benefit. It's not necessarily a, a one that you can 
monetize, at least not at this point. Um, I, I think at that point you need to explain to them, hey, you know, the money will come. This is an investment. It's an investment in my time, and later on, um, you know, there might be publication and, and there might be money. Even if there's not, though, um, it's not a waste of time by any stretch of the imagination, um, especially if you if it's cathartic for you in any way. Uh, Pops, you're mentioning that there are things that are important beyond just writing. I would say health is one of those, and mental health is another. And we have a lot of writers who who listen. I think that write because it helps them um, in in some way. It helps them cope with a lot of the things that they've had to deal with in life. Uh, so it can be cathartic. And so there is there is tangible benefit, or there is benefit, though it's not always tangible to writing. Um, and and making that clear to your family, I think, is going to help them understand that they can support you. Um, and that they should support you in your writing as well. <clears throat> well, and there's another thing too. We encourage our spouses to follow their dreams and to do something they love. We encourage our children to follow dreams, to follow what they're called to do. Um, just because we have a dream and we have a calling doesn't mean that it's any less just because it's mine. And so many times we feel like because it's my dream or my goal or my calling that somehow that makes it less important than something that somebody else's. Agreed and I think um, we can be a self-conscious group as writers and it's very easy for us to um, allow ourselves to say well my what's important to me is not as important as what as what's important to everybody else. That's another way for you to end up not writing and so you need to be able to put that aside and say Look, I can still be selfless and write. Um, I can still take care of my family and write. It's not an either or. So finding that, and I, I encourage you to to talk with your family and find how that's going to work in your family because it's going to look different for for many of you. As a matter of fact, Edie, you said you stayed up late at night. Uh, Pops, you mentioned people who got up at 4 a.m. to write. That was me. I was getting up at 4 a.m. Uh, every morning to write. Um, and when I spoke with my sleep doctor. And he asked me what time I was getting up in the mornings. I said four, and he said on purpose. <laughs> so, <laughs> kind of. Um, and so that was a conversation that I had with him that was, you know, very very fun. But I tried writing at night, and I ended up just having to delete, you know, entire chapters because it was all nonsensical, uh, and I couldn't understand any of it. I don't work well at night. My wife told me when we first got married, it was like 8.30 at night, 9 o'clock, I'm on the couch watching TV about to fall asleep. She goes, I think I'm going to clean the garage. And I said, I think I'm going to let you. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> so she works at night. I work during the morning. It, it works out well for us. So finding um, how that's going to work for you, experiment. When do you do your best writing? I like this story that uh, Tess uh, the group just posted. <clears throat> she said, I was at a writing event with Dirk Kustler. That's Clive Kustler's son. I believe he named his son after his protagonist. Um, but anyway, Dirk uh, uh, Kessler said his earliest memory was waking up from a bad dream and hearing his father's typewriter. Dad was writing, all was well with the world, and I could go back to sleep. <laughs> so I, th I thought that's great. Wake up and tear and go, oh, Dad's writing. I can go back to sleep. Everything's good. I, I have expect Stephen King's children to wake up and hear his dad writing and then Stephen... <laughs> runs in, what was your dream about? Let me take notes. <laughs> How terrifying was it? How can we make that more terrifying? Okay, now go back to sleep. Yeah. Different different things work for different families. So experiment a little bit. Um, Pops, you mentioned maximizing your free moments, uh, those little spots of time you said. Um, making use of those can be very, very powerful. One thing that I like to do is, uh, th th here are a couple tips and tricks that I like to do. Um, to make sure that my writing time is best spent, I'll end in the middle of a scene so that when I start the next day, I don't have to stare at the computer for 22 minutes trying to figure out what I'm going to write next. So even if I can finish the scene in a day, um, I'll knock off early if I can. If I've met my goal, I'll knock off a little bit early um, in the middle of a scene so that when I start the next day, I can, get, I can finish up that scene and that's going to help me transition to the next one. Um, I had a 45-minute commute. I recently took another job that's 1.2 miles away from my house. Um, it, so I'm going to have a lot less travel time to do this. But when I did have that commute time, I was listening to fiction, like you said, Pops. I was planning what I was going to write. I would often call myself 
and leave myself voicemails with ideas of what I wanted to do. Um, or I would leave myself, if I'm at the computer, I just leave myself a note. Text myself if I'm you know, at the, the grocery store, whatever it is. Um, your mind can continue to write even if you're not behind a computer. So try and, and, and maximize those moments as best you can. Let's face it, most writers are always writing. And it doesn't matter what they're doing. You wake up in the middle of the night and they're writing. Uh, you're walking along the beach, you're writing. You're sitting in a restaurant, you're writing. There's always a part of the brain that's doing something. It's either gathering information or, or uh, percolating. First writer I ever met was a little old lady. Well, that's how she appeared to me then. You know, she's <laughs> probably 15 years younger than I am now. But nonetheless, uh, um, we were just walking through the mall and she was doing a book signing at a bookstore. And those things can be horrible. Um, you know, so nobody was talking to her. So we stopped and said hi. And um, your sisters were still, uh, Crystal and Chanel were still very little. And um, she asked the names of the children. And we said, Crystal. And she goes, that's nice. We said, Chandel. And she said, that's a great name. How do you spell it? And out comes a notebook. And she begins to write the name down. And she goes, what does that name mean? Is that French? And uh, she goes, I'm going to use that in my next book. Okay, she's in the middle of a conversation, but she's still writing. And she heard something she could use. She grabbed that. So even there in the mall, trying to do a book signing, um, a little idea occurred to her and so she snagged it. So she's using the most of, of little times. And then I just want to add this one thing. Uh, there is a, a, a principle of a production uh, that says you can get a great deal done by doing just a little bit at a time. Years ago I read an article, Reader's Digest, this has got to be decades ago, but how much you can achieve, achieve in 20 minutes a day. Well, in writing, a uh, standard manuscript page, you know, 12 point times Roman, one inch margins, double space, is roughly 300 pages on average, you know, depending if it's a lot of narration or a lot of dialogue, but you can count on 300 pages, or 300 words per page. Well, if you only write one page a day, which you should be able to do in half an hour, uh, or even an hour, but, you know, certainly you could do it in half an hour, you've written a book in a year. It all just uh, it just all adds up. Absolutely, and I would also add this. Um, this I don't even, I don't know if we put this on the show notes or not. Making <clears throat> making goals for your daily writing um, is definitely helpful in the sense that um, it gives you something to work for, to strive for, and when you have a goal, you're more likely to work toward it. Um, but I would also say give yourself some license to to fail. Some days you will only write one page. Other days you will write two or three. My goal is a thousand words. On some days I get 800. Uh, on most days I'll get 14 to 15. Um, but I also understand that there's going to be some day where my son wakes up with an earache and instead of writing in the morning I've got to take him down to urgent care or whatever the case may be. Those days are going to happen. Um, and, and you can't always count on the time that you schedule. Life happens. And so trying to work ahead a little bit uh, of your goal can be a very useful trick as well. That's something that I do. If I have a daily goal in mind for the the words that I want to write, but then I also have a weekly goal, which is um, a couple of thousand words less than my daily goal if I added up all the days in the week. I try to write five days a week. I try to take a weekend every week and just have some time with family and stuff. Um, so. Uh, say my weekly goal is 10,000 or my daily goal is is 2,000 words a day that would uh, but my weekly goal is only 8,500 words and that gives me a little wiggle room in case I don't make one of the days. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the one thing that I think is m perhaps most important to making time to write is also the thing that I'm the worst at and that is telling people no. I'm really awful at telling people no. Um, and and those of you with those with day jobs, you know how it is. Um, because the more you want to write, it's the more people at your job want you to do. Um, Aaron, can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do this? Can you do that? And yeah, yeah, yeah I can do that for you. I'll, I'll help you out. And I do. I, I I think it's important to be good at your job, your day job, and to help people out. Those are all important things. Um, but at some point, you can't say yes to everything. And 
you, you'll have to kind of pick and choose. Some things you should probably say yes to, but other things you can probably say no to, and you probably should, especially if you want to get any sort of writing done. Um, otherwise, if you say yes, say, you know what, I'd, I'd love to be able to do this for you, but I'm not going to be able to get to it for this amount of time. And that's one thing that I've, I've started doing is uh, the things that I really want to do to help people out, I'll tell them I, I'd love to do that, but it's going to take me this amount of time. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll, I'll put that into my schedule. I'll give them, you know, 15, 20 minutes a, a day or whatever the case may be, but I don't compromise the writing time. Uh, so telling each other, telling other people no is what I'm the worst at, but I think it's also the one thing that you can do right away that's going to have the most impact on your the time in your schedule. Pops, do you have the same problem? Yeah, I do. Um, and I did for a long time, as, as uh, most of our listeners know. I used to be a pastor, and so uh, it doesn't take long before the ability to say no is uh, quickly stripped away from you. Um, and it's, it, it's kind of I used to resent weddings. Wait a minute, that's just going to take a lot of time from the writing. Um, you know, you, you sure you just want to, we'll just meet at the church uh, after services and I'll just say you, you were married and then that's it. But of course not, you know, and that was incredibly selfish of me. I never said anything like that. I always uh, sacrificed the writing for it because it was far more important. But nonetheless, um, I would get very greedy with the time. And I know some writers who won't answer the phone and they'll let their wives say, no, he's not available now. Uh, uh, to talk because uh, people will try to take the time. I got a call on the, the Blue Ridge conference today. Somebody who wants to teach there sent me an email, and then um, five minutes later was calling me. And I'm I'm in the middle of trying to do something, so it really pulled me out of what I was doing. Um, and so it, it, people don't understand either uh, how mentally grueling writing can be, and to get knocked out of what you're doing, get knocked out of that flow. Um, can be very uh, discouraging. It's hard to get back in. And, uh, you know, someone said, I can never do what you do. I can't sit at a computer all day. Um, you know, how can you just sit there? And I thought, I'm, I'm not there. <laughs> I'm not there. I mean, I spent all day uh, today in 1925, so um, I'm not there. My body might be there, but I'm not there. My mind is elsewhere uh, and in, enjoying every bit of it. So, People understand, and since it's not real physical labor or you're not trading stocks, uh, a lot of people think writing is very important. Um, and sometimes you just have to deal with that. So saying no is, you know, it's, it's, it's not really just a hobby. It's, you know, a career you're trying to build or at least a, a goal you're trying to accomplish. And you, you do have to say no. You have the same problem, Edie, or are you, uh, you pretty good at telling people no? No, I have, that is my worst thing ever. Uh, fortunately, m at times when I'm on deadline or really trying to get something done, my family builds a wall around me. Kirk will take my phone, my boys will look at me and go, Mom, aren't you supposed to be writing? Um, so I'm really fortunate to have a good support system as far as that goes, and they help me remember and set priorities. So. It, it works for me, but yeah, that's my worst thing is saying no. I think, you know, I, I really blame my father, and I mean, we, we could have a, a deep discussion <laughs> about all my daddy issues, um, but, you know, he instilled this work ethic in me, and, uh, you know, I, I really enjoy being good at my jobs, and so when I when I have a job, I want I want to be the best at it. I want, I'm a high school teacher. I want to be the best high school teacher I can be. Um, I'm a writer. I want to be the best writer I can be. And so that drive is in me. So when people ask me something that I know is going to make me a better teacher and it's going to make me a better employee, um, I, want, I want to make them happy. And so there's that part of me that I, I've learned, I've had to learn, and I'm not sure I have, learn how to balance. Um, you know what? That would be better for my day job, but it's not going to be better for my writing. That's not something that I can do. Uh, and I enjoyed working at a place where I had some fantastic colleagues and the backing of administration. It was a really, really difficult decision uh, to to leave the school I was working at because I loved everyone there and and um, I was well respected. Um, and so now I'm going into a, a different school and I'm going to be kind of low man on the totem pole, if you will. But um, I'm going to work hard and I'm going to do well there. But I also understand that. 
part of the reason I decided to leave was because I was saying yes to my writing. I was saying yes to my writing. I wasn't saying no to my other school. I was saying yes to my writing, and this is going to afford me more time. And so that was a very difficult decision that I had to make, um, but I, th I think it was the right choice. I'm, I'm confident that it was. You know, Jack Cavanaugh, who you had on as a guest uh, sometime back, uh, he used to joke that uh, when he became a writer, all it took was 10 years of absolutely no social life, that all his spare time was spent writing. I don't know if that was actually 10 years, but that was... <laughs> you know, the line that he would use is that he chose not to go out every time he got an invitation, not to do everything, not to see every movie. He had to find time to write, and he had to make time to write, and that's what he was doing. And so he sacrificed, is it really a sacrifice? Uh, I, I don't know, but he, you know, he sacrificed uh, a lot of social stuff uh, to, to become a writer. But uh, thankfully, most writers are not very social to begin with. <laughs> We like ourselves and we like our characters. Um, oh. I, I don't even like all of my characters. So <laughs> I don't know if that what that says about me. So uh, I was going to drop a couple more real quick ones. Um, first of all, uh, differentiate between your have tos and your want tos, uh, mm -hmm. especially when. Um, writer's block, I mean, when you don't want to write, there will be days where you have it scheduled and you have the time, but all of a sudden you have to pay bills right now. Um, all of a sudden, you have to do this right now, and, and that's not necessarily the case. You want to do this right now, perhaps. Perhaps there's a new movie that you want to go see. Uh, not Jurassic World. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you to skip that one. Uh, but you might feel like you have to do something, and you don't necessarily have to. It's more of a want um, and a desire. You'll notice, I don't, know, I don't know if you guys are the same as me, but when I get close to the end of a project, um, well, this really happened at the the end of uh, the Hand of Adonai series when I started getting close toward writing the end of that series. Um, I started making excuses not to write, and I think it was because I didn't want to finish the story. I didn't want it to end. I I you know really loved what I created, and um, to to put the end on that for good like that just broke my heart. And so I found a lot of want tos that became have tos right around the time I was starting the, the final book in that series. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, I don't know. That's, I guess, a psychological thing. But one of the other things that I've, I've learned to do is to reward myself by using those want-tos. You know what I really want to do right now is insert whatever it is you want to do. I really want to go see that new movie. Great. I will watch a later showing, and I'm going to spend the next two hours writing. Um, and once I'm done, if I can hit 5,000 words today, if I can write two days' worth of... of of writing, um, then I'll go and see that movie. I'll reward myself. So taking some of those want tos and turning them into these kind of carrots on the string, I find is kind of an effective tactic for myself. Uh, I don't know if you guys use that at all. Well, on the movie side, uh, uh, movies have been a great help to me. Uh, I would often solve plot problems by going to the movies. Uh, it would have nothing to do with the movie. But uh, what I finally realized was I'm sitting in a dark place and story is being uh, portrayed in front of me and that activates that creative side of the brain and at times I'd be stuck in some kind of plot problem I couldn't get out of and then things would start occurring to me. Ideas for books have occurred to me so for me going to a movie is is more than just entertainment it's uh, it's recharging the creative juices that won't be true for everyone I don't get the same thing out of television oddly enough but for the movies I do uh, maybe it's the popcorn I don't but somehow it gets the creative uh, juices going again. But that's true. You, I, you, you have to distinguish between what it is you want to do, what you have to do. Absolutely. How about you, Edie? Well, I think it's. I think that's where you make that transition from a wannabe writer uh, to someone who's really serious about it. Is when you begin writing through. Um, the hard spots and where you where you don't want to uh, where it's difficult and it'd be easier to find something else that needs to be done whereas you have a commitment to churn out those many uh, words for that particular day and I've had to learn that sometimes sometimes you gotta write junk to get to the jewels 
Um, you know, it's just, it's very hard to put words on paper when you know that you're going to have to go back and fix them. But the truth of the matter is, it's much easier to fix them once they're on the paper than to face another blank page. Um, and also, as far as the mental game goes, I found that I have to really be careful who I choose as my companions on this writing road. Um, you know, there are a lot of people out there who want to be writers, who love to talk about writing, uh, who love to dream about writing, but they would never, they will never prioritize it. And those kind of people, if you hang out with them, they will help you find excuses not to write. Um, so you have to pick your traveling companions very carefully. Well said. I like that you say it to traveling companions. Uh, I, I go back to this idea of having a day job, and if your boss comes to you and says, hey, I need this done, you're probably going to do it. But the transition to writing, which is very much self-directed, you don't have a boss breathing down your neck. And that sometimes makes you feel like you've got uh, the sense of freedom that you want to exercise, and this time is my time, I'm going to do what I want. Okay, that's fine. You know, make sure you're doing things that you enjoy. Um, I wouldn't recommend forfeiting a, a social life for a decade. I mean, you should go hang out with your friends at some point, but not at the expense of writing. Don't always hang out with your friends and never write. Um, employ somebody, if you have to, to yell at you and say, hey, you have to write. You have to go do that now. Um, hire a boss if you need to <laughs> find somebody. Um, luckily, I married uh, you know Naomi, and she's my Careful. boss. Careful, watch so. it. Watch it now. Easy. <laughs> she's, she's the boss. She's the boss. So um, she'll tell me go write, and and I will write. Um, so uh, I have nothing but positive things to say about Naomi. I don't know why you got nervous right there, pops. I'm just thinking you never obeyed that quickly when you were here. No, <laughs> you're growing you, up. You don't have a brown belt in karate, so uh, Naomi does. So. Uh, <laughs> Also, she's pretty. Um, so there are a couple things as well. I would also say uh, limit your distractions. Uh, mm -hmm. Unplug yourself. Um, it's very easy. I know a lot of writers who will uh, turn off their Wi-Fi or they'll go someplace that doesn't have Wi-Fi, which is increasingly hard to find these days, um, so that they're not constantly checking their email or checking NFL.com or um, you know, I wonder what's on television right now, or playing on their phone, or even if you're not playing on your phone, uh, we're in a, an age where most of us have cell phones and anybody can call us whenever, the, whenever they feel like it. Uh, you know, putting your phone on vibrate or on silent, um, whatever it is that you need to do to limit those distractions so the time that you've scheduled is actually time that you're writing. Uh, I think scheduling writing is one of the easiest things to do. I think it's harder to actually write once you've scheduled that time. So I think the first step of, of a, a beginning writer who wants to write but feels like they don't have time is to say, I don't have time and they haven't looked or they haven't prioritized it. Then once they do, what do you do with that time that you've scheduled it in? Um, and, and one way to make that productive so that you can have some productive writing time is to limit those distractions. Absolutely. One of the things that I've discovered is people are very gracious if, if about leaving messages if you do call them back. Um, so I've gotten to where I only answer my phone at certain times of the day and um, use that time to also return phone calls. Um, I don't have to be tied to my phone and it's been very freeing and you get a heck of a lot more done. Best line I ever heard about the phone was when they first came out. A guy didn't have a phone in his house, and somebody asked him about it, and he said, I don't see the sense of having a bell in my house that any fool anywhere in the world can ring at any time of the day. <laughs> you know, there's something to that. Anybody at any point can interrupt me at any time. Um, so, yeah, I think that's good. In fact, when I do this, I leave my phone in another room. Uh, you know, if my wife were out of the house, I would have it in case, you know, she got a flat tire or something. But um, beyond that, uh, I would leave it in the other room as I'm doing now. And uh, But it is hard to break that that habit. We don't always yeah. have to be available. Yeah, that's the thing, making yourself unavailable, giving yourself the permission to say, I'm not available for this thing currently. Right now, my attention is on this. And, it, I mean, if you think about it, I go back to this whole day job idea. My cell phone rings in the middle of class while I'm teaching. I don't pick it up, you know. I mean, you, 
I'm appalled. Like if you go, if you're at, you know McDonald's and somebody's going to take your order and they're on their phone, uh, what? Like <laughs> who's on their phone during their day job? Like who's doing personal stuff? Your boss would never allow it. But all of a sudden, when you're your own boss, well now it's fine. Now it's okay if I'm available. Uh, go ahead and give yourself the permission to be unavailable. Uh, you need to if you want to be productive. Um, so you, you definitely want to do that. Pops, you, you said uh, you have a Jerry Jenkins story there about limiting oh. distractions. <laughs> yeah, another Jerry Jenkins story. Uh, same guy I mentioned earlier. Uh, of course, he's done very well now. You know, he hit it big. and uh, uh, So he's got a very big home. But when he was having his home designed, he built what he called the cave. I think that's what he calls it, the cave. And it's a place where he goes uh, to write when he wants to get some serious writing done. It has a computer that does not connect to the internet. It has a phone only his wife can ring, um, so no one else can call in, and so that's it. Yeah. Is, it, is, it is it soundproof? It may be. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. It's a it's a big house, but nonetheless, it's uh, the the point is when he has to think, he has to focus. Uh, he gets rid of all the distraction. He has a place he goes to, uh, and it. What he told me was, he says. When I walk in there, I know what I'm there for. That's the only thing I can do is write. So that's what I'm going to do. I don't yeah. think he has any other books unless he's using them for like research or something. He sits down and begins to crank the words out. I was going to do the same thing, but I don't have a best-selling series. Um, so yet, not yet. No. Once the hand of Adonai hits, then I'll, I'll build my own house there. So still waiting for that to happen. Uh, one tip that I picked up that I thought was kind of cool is compartmentalizing your time. So we've already talked about scheduling. Um, having a written schedule is very beneficial in, in a few ways because if you don't have one, then the, the unpaid bills are going to start creeping into the back of your mind while you're writing, and that can be costly for your writing. Um, but if you look at your schedule and you go, oh, I pay bills in two hours, or you go, oh, Monday is my bill paying day. I'm going to do it then. It, what it does is it allows you to free up your mind. And this was actually something when I, I don't sleep often. Um, and I, I'm one of those guys where I wake up and my mind is just consistently going and it will not stop no matter how much I tell it to. Uh, I think, Pops, you might. I get that from you, I'm sure. So I, I'm going to go ahead and blame you on air. Um, and we can I, fight I, I about it I appreciate that, yeah. Yeah, and you'd be so, right too. So yeah, uh, and and so in this uh, the sleep doctor I was talking to, I don't know what you call those doctors who study sleep, but he uh, mentioned compartmentalizing time. So when you wake up and you're worried about what you're going to teach the next day, you say, no, 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 I'm going in an hour early so I can worry about it then. Um, or when your brain starts to worry about the other thing. No, 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 I've already put that in my schedule. I know when I'm going to worry about that. It's not right now. Right now, I'm going to worry about sleeping. Uh, right now, I'm going to worry about writing. Uh, and so by having those compartmentalized, having it in your schedule where you can point to it and say, yes, that's the time I do that, it's going to help your mind stay a little more focused. I don't know if you guys use that trick at all. I've not done it that way. Uh, I have set aside uh, certain times for the bill paying. Uh, and for other things, I know that's what's going to go on. Um, but I have suffered from this, and this is a, a trap that creatives fall into, is there's a lot of stuff we want to do, and I end up doing far too many. And so I'm a, I'm a juggler who's juggling one too many things. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of time before I lose all of them. You know, so I have to, I have to rethink that. Um, but I have been that way for as long as I can remember. I have too many ideas that interest me, and so more and more I'm trying to trim it down uh, to do that which is important, uh, that which I really want to do, and uh, and to focus on that. Excellent. How about you, Edie? Um, I do work in chunks of time, and um, I set aside different times to do different things. I never thought about setting aside time to worry about things, that, that could really help because I do that a lot. My mind goes, it, it's awful at night. I'm, I'm not related, but I have that same gene in, in my family line as well. But one thing that I do is I've determined when I am most creative and I guard that time uh, with everything I have. 
Um, you know, because there are times like early afternoon for me is just I should be taking a nap. Um, but if I can't take a nap, at least I can schedule social media or answer an email or two or something. But as far as cranking out words, uh, creative words, that that's a toughie for me. I'll do less than half of what I would normally do if I get up and I guard that time from 8 in the morning until 12 in the afternoon. That's my golden time. Um, so I try to guard at least part of that time so that I can use it for writing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, a couple other things here. Uh, I feel like we've already talked about this, but the, the thing about writer's block, what happens when you sit down, uh, there's a, a couple different ways that you can schedule time. You can actually say, here's my block of time. Uh, I'm going to write from 8 a.m. till 12 p.m. Um, or I'm going to write a thousand words or fifteen hundred words. I'm going to start at eight, and whenever I'm done, I'm done. Uh, what happens when you sit down and you can't write? What happens when the words aren't coming? Um, that that can be a real challenge. But I like what you said, Edie, about um, write through the junk to find the jewels. Uh, you know, give yourself permission to write poorly the first time, uh, especially if you're going by word count. Uh, if you're writing a thousand words a day you might write 500 of them that are terrible. It might actually be closer to 700, but eventually you're going to get to those 300 that are good, and that's what's going to really solidify your scene for you, and that's what you're going to use as a foundation to rewrite it uh, later on when you complete the manuscript, um, or at least the first draft of the manuscript. So don't be afraid to, to write through writer's block. Uh, that's one thing that I would say with that. Yeah, I want to add something to that. And don't judge at that time whether or not it's good. Right. I will often uh, write some pages and I'll think, well, this is the worst thing I've ever written. I've lost it. It's gone. I don't have the touch anymore. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a loser, of course. You know, that's the down, downward spiral at that point. But I keep thinking, this is no good. I'm going to have to rewrite this whole thing or just toss it. But I never do. I just keep going. And then later, sometimes a couple days later, I'll go back and reread it and think, well, it's not that bad. Add a line here, a little transition there, and you know, take it in a little. It looks good. So uh, don't judge at that time when you're feeling emotional about it. Just keep going. Uh, you can always come back and change because writing isn't writing until you have rewritten anyway. So you don't care if it's perfect. Right now, you get the story down, then you get to go back and do the massage, the, the sanding, the fine points. You know, add a little here and all that stuff. Add the special ingredients, the magic. How many metaphors can I get in here? Um, can you, you say know, something about whitewater rafting? Whitewater rafting. Uh, <laughs> what? That was, that was our metaphor du jour. Was that last week? I think it was last week, yeah, the whitewater rafting. Well, I, I mean, if we want to kind of continue that theme in context of writing, I think that writing uh, is a lot like whitewater rafting, except that you are responsible for creating the current. And so when your phone goes off, that current stops and you're dead in the water. And it takes a while to get it to build up again, to build up that momentum, uh, which is why it's important to really limit your distractions. Uh, I did a, an article some time ago on momentum, the momentum of writing. One aspect is writing every day, and the other is, is maximizing your word count. Um, and a lot of that good writing seems to, once you get that flow going, once you get the, the rapids going, then you're just on for the ride, man. Let those words come. But... Um, the beginning, at least for me, is always the hardest. It's generating that current to get us going, which would be right. one reason. Which would be one reason why you want to do the thinking ahead of time, uh, to leave myself notes so that when I come back to it, the the current is already there. Have I taken this yeah, too writing, far? No, no. Writing doesn't uh, begin when you sit down and put your fingers over the keyboard. If you're waiting that long to figure out what you're going to say, then you're gonna have a very slow day. Uh, most writers I know, this stuff's percolating all the time. Wake up in the middle of the night, you're thinking, okay, how am I going to handle that scene? And that's what I think about. I begin to, I begin to visualize it. Uh, and so I'm thinking ahead of time. This is especially true for intuitive writers. Uh, outliners usually struggle with it when they do the outline, but intuitive writers often don't quite know what's going to happen next. Uh, and uh, I find that I prefer to have some idea as I go in uh, what the scene's going to be. I may not know what the next scene after that's going to be, but I've got that one in mind. And then once I start, all of a sudden it starts uh, uh, taking over. I tell people it's like public speaking. Pu those who do a lot of public speaking uh, learn that they might be apprehensive, they might be nervous, 
Uh, but when they stand up, and as soon as they hear their voice, they get started, and they get that first line right, it's a whole different ballgame. Same thing with writing. You sit down, you get a few lines in, and then it begins to start flowing most of the time. Absolutely. I think that's very true. Now, Pops, you also mentioned here on the show notes that every day is a new beginning. What do you mean by that? Well, we get too hard on ourselves. You know, I didn't get my thousand words or my 300 words or whatever it is that I can fit in. Every day is a new start. You're not going to get to go backwards. You don't get to go back to Monday and say, well, I wish I'd handled that better. You just got to forget it uh, and uh, push. When you go to bed at night, I, I think of it as pushing the middle res uh, reset button. Everything gets to start all over again. So every day is a new start. Don't worry about the past. What you worry about is today. And uh, you don't worry about tomorrow because that's going to be a new start too. Uh, so don't be too rough on yourself. Just get it done today. And then you get tomorrow's stuff done tomorrow. Absolutely. Well, do we have any last bits of advice, Edie? Any last minute comments or questions here for us? I think we've just about covered it all. I think the biggest thing is, you know, um, stay true to what you know you want to do to make your dream come true and don't don't hesitate to make those hard choices. It's definitely worth it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Edie, how can people get in touch with you? How can our listeners get in touch with you if they want to contact you? Um, you can visit my website, ediemelson.com, or you can email me, uh, edie at ediemelson.com, either of those ways. Excellent. All right. And, uh, Pops, how can people get in touch with you? Well, I'm going to add to Edie's uh, real quick and say that uh, she also blogs at the Blue Ridge site, brmcwc.com or my hyphen CWC, whichever you want to use. Um, but anyway, uh, she blogs there on Mondays. Uh, I just put up a post today on Wednesday, how to read like a writer. Um, and so that's a, a lot of good stuff about writing goes on there. And uh, whether you want to go to a conference or not is secondary. We just want to keep encouraging people through all of that. And the uh, best thing to do is follow me at uh, altingansky.com. And uh, that's where I announce new stuff that's coming out and occasionally blog. Excellent. And I'm always at AaronGansky.com. You can also find me on the Facebook and the Twitter. Uh, and my author page, Facebook.com slash Aaron D. Gansky, is where you can participate on our First Line Fridays competitions. Uh, and you'll find links at AaronGansky.com to vote for your favorite First Line from June so that I can find out who won because I'm I'm very eager to find out who won. And so uh, we thank you all for listening. We hope that you will join us next week as we talk about how to write a book proposal. So thank you all for listening, and until next week, good writing. <laughs>